some more people are going to be joining us, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I just want to say hello. Thank you for joining us. And Heather, you want to go ahead and kick us off? Absolutely. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, we are so excited to be partnering with AOS and Jennifer Garner. Um, this is something that we've been wanting to do in person um, for, I don't know, probably a year or so now. And um, I'm just glad that we could still make it happen. Uh, these two agencies and, and organizations have so much knowledge and helping us with the business of caregiving. And often um, that is one of the biggest stressors is figuring out how to make that plan, figuring out um, how, how to do it and, and who needs to be on that care team. Um, Dementia Alliance of North Carolina wants to be a part of your care team. And, and that's why we're here today um, to really provide those resources. But we know that sometimes we have to bring in other experts to um, help us. So thank you for being a part of this series here today. Uh, if you are new to Dementia Alliance, our organization is a statewide local nonprofit 501c3 and our whole mission is to improve the lives of those living with dementia. And that looks like a couple of different ways. That's providing education like we are here today. Um, that's navigating families through the journey one-on-one -on -one, uh, with our dementia navigation. Some of you may know Didi. Uh, we also have a wonderful music and memory at home program. So if you think that that's something that you or your family member could benefit from, um, I'm happy to send you more information about that. Um, we also fund a, a little bit of local research. And so really trying to do our part to truly improve the lives of those living with dementia right here in North Carolina. So um, thank you for being a part of this today. If this is something that you like and you're not on our mailing list, please go to our website. There'll be a little box that pops up and you can join our mailing list and we try not to spam you, but it really does have valuable information um, to be there. So with that, I'll turn it back to Lisa to get us started, but thank you so much for being with us today. And um, thank you to Jennifer and Susan for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Kevin, we appreciate it. Uh, Susan, do you want to say a good morning to everybody before we kick it off? Good morning, everybody. I'm Susan McKenzie, and I have the privilege of working with Aging Outreach Services um, as their Marketing and Public Relations Director. And it is such a joy to see Jennifer Tyner at work with clients. She is such a calming voice in a time of crisis um, that I have personally experienced and I have watched families experience. So I hope you'll learn a lot from Jennifer today. Aging Outreach Services is an elder care firm. We have a care management company and we also have a caregiver registry that's able to send caregivers into your home, wherever that may be, in your private home, in a community setting, um, we're there to support you. And we also do a monthly publication. It's called Outreach North Carolina, and it's filled with all kinds of great resources and information. So we invite you to join our mailing list as well. So thank you for being here today. We are honored to work with Dementia Alliance and with Jennifer Garner on this project. Thank you so much, Susan. And um, I've known these ladies for many years now mm -hmm. and I'm so excited to be able to partner with everyone today to bring this uh, bring this to light in a new format if you will for us on uh, this webinar so uh, just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone you should have a little bubble that says chat underneath it uh, somewhere on the edge of your screen probably at the bottom feel free to um, type in that and everyone, you can type to everyone or you can type to each other or just to the panelists. And we will be uh, answering your questions from that chat box because this is a webinar, everyone is muted and we, um, we're not seeing you today, but hopefully you can see us and we um, will be answering your questions in the chat and Susan and I will be helping direct your, your questions to Jennifer as she goes. 
these sessions, we have four. So the link that you were emailed will be the same link for all of them, but we will resend it for each session. So we have today and Thursday and then next week again, Tuesday and Thursday. Today we're talking about making a plan. Then we'll talk about advanced directives, then resources to aid your plan. And finally, payment resources. How do you pay for medical care? So today we have Jennifer. Thursday we have our other Jennifer. Tuesday we have this Jennifer. Next Thursday we have our other other Jennifer, at least you can't go wrong when you address your question to a Jennifer. So that makes it easy. Um, so with all of that said, um, we will send you a recording link for each of these sessions so you can refer back to them. Or if you will miss one in the series, uh, please know that we will send you a link so that you really won't miss out. We will send you the slides for each session as well. And if we need to reach out to you later with additional resources, we absolutely will do that. So thank you all for joining us. I'm going to ask our other panelists if they would mute themselves and stop their video. And Jennifer, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I know that you're going to do a little introduction for yourself, so I'm not going to go into that too much, but we really appreciate your time today. And we'll get started. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Not yet. Okay. That's all I can see right now. So <laughs> let me go back. I'm going to start over. Okay. How about now? No, it doesn't look like it. I see. Only, I only see you, Lisa. I don't see anybody else. No. Um, I don't see your screen. <laughs> I'm going to just try to completely start over. The fun of technology. Oh, yes. Okay wants me to leave the meeting and I don't want to do that. No, we'd rather you not leave. Okay, share screen. Let's try this again. Well, now i got to get back up. You can see me now? I can see you. Okay. I just can't see what you're sharing. Okay. How about now? It looks like you are um, maybe showing the screen of you on, I don't know, maybe. It was so up the whole time. Now it's being a pain. Okay, let me try this. Okay. There we go. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Get you to start that slideshow. There we go. Can you see me now? Yes, awesome. perfect. All right, thanks. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jennifer Tyner from Aging Outreach Services. Um, I have been a care manager here for almost 18 years. This summer will be 18 years. So I've been around a long time. Um, I was asked to present today to you guys on um, how we recommend that you promote your own successful aging. Um, aging Outreach Services, our tagline is the experts in aging well. So um, as a care manager, my goal and my job is to help my clients and older adults to um, have the knowledge that they need to age well. Um, I love the little acronym KEY, K-E-Y, knowledge empowers you. Um, so that's one of the things that I hope to be able to offer you guys today is some knowledge of things that you guys did not have knowledge of. Um, I'm a quote person, so forgive me, but um, 
this one came to mind today when I was thinking about how I was going to guide you guys in the right direction. Um, it says, be aware of your surroundings. A bird cannot fly in water. Um, so my hope today is to get you guys out of the water and back in the air um, um, so that you guys are aware of what's around you and what you're experiencing and what's available to you so that you can start to fly again. So um, like Lisa said, the chat option is on. I cannot see the chat option, but the other panelists can. So if you want to type in a question, um, they will um, acknowledge your question and put it out to me at appropriate times. Um, so feel free to ask questions throughout my entire presentation, OK? Um, this is me. <laughs> um, I like to say that planning is just as important at age 70 as it was at age 20. I think a lot of people don't understand how important planning is. And I encourage everybody to start young. And those of us who didn't start maybe at 20 like we should have, we still need to make a plan. So um, I hope that I can enhance and um, explore ways for you to enjoy that journey of aging. Um, it's, you know, Betty White said, getting old in for sissies. Um, so I'm going to help you guys um, make that a lot easier. Um, I am a member of ALCA, which is the Aging Life Care Association. Um, our areas of expertise, um, we like to use this circle um, chart that talks about where we are experts in aging, health and disability, financial, housing, family, local resources, advocacy, legal, and the most important, in my opinion, crisis intervention. So I'm going to touch on all of those um, today. I won't do a lot on the legal part because I know Jennifer Garner is going to really focus on that on Thursday, and I don't want to be too redundant in regards to that, but I will touch on it a little bit today in my presentation. Um, uh, we see that the most common question across the board is how am I going to pay for care? Um, private pay, Medicare, Medicaid, long-term care insurance. How much is it going to cost to provide care? What, what options are available to me? Um, am I going to age in my home or am I going to um, need to move into a facility? Um, we talk quite a bit about the financial piece. The differences in cost comes with the different services that are available to you um, or that, you're, that you actually need. It, it really depends on the level of care you need and whether you plan on aging in place or moving into a facility, if you need equipment, hiring caregivers, or having a family member act. So there's not a magic number of this is how much it's going to cost. Unfortunately, for most of you who are participants today, your loved one has dementia, and that increases the cost of care significantly, no matter where they are, if they're at home or if they're, they need equipment or they're in a facility. Um, how will I pay for my future needs? So a lot of people assume that Medicare will cover a lot of the services that you might need, whether it's in a house or in a facility. But the truth is Medicare doesn't pay for a whole lot of anything. Um, Medicare will pay for a temporary stay in a skilled nursing facility for rehab. They will pay for a temporary nurse to come into your home to provide care for your loved one. Um, maybe daily, every other day, a couple of days a week, um, if your loved one is sent home from the hospital um, or from a skilled nursing facility, um, Medicare may provide what they call home health services. That's really just a nurse. It's not an aide that does the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but there's not a lot of the day-in, day-out needs that Medicare will cover. Um, Medicaid, that is, you can qualify for Medicaid um, if you're an older adult or have, um, if you qualify financially. 
Um, Medicaid will pay for some in-home care. Um, we call that a cap worker. Um, if you qualify currently here in Moore County, there's a really long wait for a cap worker. There's not a lot of um, services that are available to those who are on Medicaid in their house. Um, Medicaid will pay for a skilled nursing facility if you qualify financially. Um, it'll pay for, there's a program under Medicaid called special assistance that will sometimes pay for assisted living and memory care that, um, again, you must qualify for financially. Um, but the special assistance, there is a, a, a number that you have to, your income must be less than it's about $1,100 for assisted living and $1,500 for memory care. If your income is less than those numbers, then you could possibly qualify for special assistance and let Medicaid pay for assisted living. Um, we've run into some really great long-term care insurance programs that will pay for almost anything across the board. Um, they'll pay for home care, they'll pay for assisted living, they'll pay for skilled nursing, they'll even pay for some of your equipment or for our services. Um, but that's some of the things that you have to, again, make have made a good plan. Um, the, all the policies are different, each person's qualifications are different. Um, but that is something that you could purchase um, or encourage your family members who are younger and healthier to purchase so that they can have the help in the future. Um, and then there's veterans benefits that can pay for care. Um, so again, that sometimes is a financial qualifier. Some people who are um, disabled um, through the military may get certain benefits. The Veterans Affairs offers a program called Aid in Attendance, which we'll get to later, but it will pay for home care and care in a facility if you qualify. And of course, there's private pay, which is the most popular um, payment method for care, especially in the home. Um, and then a lot of times across the board in facilities as well. So private pay is the direct payment by the client. It can be supplemented, um, but it comes directly from the client. Um, again, Medicare is not going to pay for you to have a companion in your house, somebody to come in and do light housekeeping, laundry, showers, that kind of thing. They're just not going to pay for that. So that is where your private pay type payments come in play. And then if you don't meet the financial qualifications for facility placement, again, then you're expected to pay privately for those services as well. Medicare, um, most of you guys know that it's a nationwide program. Um, it's for people who are 65 and older or people who have disabilities. Part A Medicare pays for hospital and nursing facility care. Um, it also pays for hospice services. Part B is physicians, therapies, and home health care. Again, that does not mean that it'll pay for a caregiver to come into the house and provide the care or respite care that you might need. It just provides a home health care nurse to kind of oversee what's going on and report back to your doctor for a temporary time. And again, those therapies can be inpatient, outpatient, but it's a temporary payment method through Medicare. Medicaid, um, it's a federal or state insurance assistance program. It offers benefits to people who have limited resources, are disabled, or are elderly. All the skilled nursing facilities participate in the Medicaid program. What happens is let's say your income is $3,000 a month and, you're, um, and it costs $7,000 a month to stay in your skilled nursing facility. They, they will take your $3,000 income and then the government will subsidize and pay for the remaining um, amount that's due to the facility. And they'll give you back $30 or so each month to pay for personal care needs. Um, but it, it wouldn't matter if your income was $6,999 and, and it costs $7,000 to live there, you give them your $6,999 and then the government will give you that other dollar. 
Um, and it wouldn't matter if your income was $100, the same thing would apply. Um, so all the skilled nursing facilities um, accept Medicaid. Not all of the assisted living facilities will accept Medicaid. Um, so we, you wanna make sure that when you're looking at resources and you're talking about placement options for your loved one, if you're gonna need Medicaid in the future, um, you wanna make sure that that facility does accept those services for, for future needs. Long-term care insurance, um, privately issued policy helps covers the cost of just about any care that you might need. The premiums are based on your age, your health, the length of deductible, amount paid, and the duration of benefits. We frequently see with these policies that they'll have an elimination period. So you pay out of pocket for the first 30 to 90 days that you need help. And then they will kick in and start paying for either a maximum daily benefit or a monthly benefit, um, depending on what kind of policy you have. It will also pay for, um, it will either, excuse me, either pay for um, a certain amount of time. So it might say, we'll pay you $3,000 a month for five years, or it, you could have a lifetime benefit. So you wanna make sure that when you're looking into those policies that you're looking at the duration of the benefits. So how long is that benefit gonna pay for the care that you need? A lot of the newer long-term care insurance policies will also pay for the equipment that you might need in your home. So whether you need a ramp, a hospital bed, widen your doorways, um, there's a lot of things that that um, long-term care insurance policy can cover. And it will also pay for a care manager, somebody like me to come in and provide you with a care plan and oversight. Um, of caregiver services. So there, is a, there are a lot of benefits to having that long-term care insurance policy. Veterans benefits, um, you can find this on the va.gov, but service-connected disability compensation, um, you have to apply for it, but the compensation depends on the rating of your disability. So if they say you're 100% disabled, you'll get a percentage of that. If, they, if, you, if you're 50% disabled, you'll get a percentage of that. Um, there are some monthly um, compensations, additional monetary benefits if you require significant help with personal care needs or you are bedridden. The one we work with mostly is called aid and attendance. Again, you have to qualify financially for that program, but if you require help and you're with personal care, you're bedridden, you live at home or a nursing home, um, even having poor eyesight can help um, qualify you for aid and attendance, but it can pay for a caregiver to come into your home and provide the care that you need. Um, again, there's a, a maximum benefit, just like with the long-term care insurance. It may be that it only covers $100 a day or $1,000 a month, but it depends on your income, the, the disability or the needs that you have. They take It's kind of a formula. And then they have a housebound allowance as well. So if you're significantly restricted to your residence, you can get um, an allowance through that. So you have to have served in, in a branch of the military during wartime. So it can be one day of wartime, but if you serve during one day of wartime, um, you, you could qualify for these benefits um, in your home and in a facility. I'm gonna go back to that slide. The one thing that we are missing, and I'll, I'll make sure Ash gets this added to the slide, is hospice. Um, we talk a lot about dementia and how somebody with dementia may qualify for hospice services. Um, and hospice is covered 100% under Medicare. So hospice, um, dementia can qualify you to, to receive benefits through hospice. Um, if, if your doctor feels like you have less than six months to live, or if you are bedridden, your verbal skills are diminished, um, there are several different qualifiers that can get you covered under hospice or palliative care. Um, those services can include a bath aid coming to the house up to five days a week to provide a bath, can provide a nurse coming to your home every week and as needed. 
It can provide a social worker who can come into your house um, and provide some of the management type things that you might need assistance with. And it can also provide a volunteer and a chaplain to come in and provide services that you might need in the home. So hospice is another benefit that you guys may want to look into in the future. But um, a lot of people are um, a little he um, hesitant to look into hospice services because they feel like that means their loved one is near the end of their life. But I encourage you to make sure that you don't wait too long to use that benefit. What Jennifer, option? Yes. Jennifer, this is Lisa. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're fine. Um, going back to Medicaid, we had a question on the difference between CAP services and personal care services. So they're basically the same. Um, so the personal care services and the CAP worker could be, um, th that word's used interchangeably. The CAP, CAP is usually the worker, so it's called a CAP worker. Um, again, here in Moore County, we have a really long wait list to, to qualify for getting actually somebody to come into the house to help you. Um, if you already have Medicaid and you're in the home, you're likely to more easily qualify to get that cap worker. But if it's something that you're, you know, as you've aged, you're looking at placement options versus staying at home, um, you can get those personal care services in the home through a cap worker. And can you tell me what cap stands for? Um, no, I cannot right now. Okay. <laughs> um, I know what it is, but off the top of my head, I can't think of what it is. Um, I'm sure someone in our chat can tell us. So, yeah. um, I just, you know, the, all those acronyms, we want to clear that up for everybody. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we had a comment also, um, um, we just con contracted for palliative service and learned my dad has qualified for Medicare coverage a few years ago, better late than never, but we wish we had known he qualified once he was diagnosed with dementia. Um, so somebody just saying that they wish that they had known earlier that someone qualified. So I guess it's a good reminder for all of us to check into these services to make sure um, we can use them. For sure. I mean, even though they may be hard to access, I, I always talk about veterans benefits when it comes to being hard to access. I mean, the veterans benefits, you really jump through a lot of hoops to get qualified. You have to have discharge paperwork and, you know, it's really kind of a pain to qualify. But as soon as you start that application process, until you qualify, they will retro pay you back to that date that you started that process. I mean, I've had clients that have gotten their benefits in just a couple months, but I've had several wait years to get their benefits, but they will retro pay them back to the beginning of when they started that application. That's good to so, know. Yeah, so it's really important to know that it, fight through those things, find somebody, find a professional, whether it's a care manager, an attorney, go to the, the veterans benefits locally. We have a veterans affairs office here in Moore County. There's probably one in every county, um, but go to that person and, and get the assistance that you need because even though it might take a really long time, you wanna make sure that you're getting those benefits that you deserve. Thank you. And so Lisa and Susan are telling us it's community alternative program, program. Yeah. which I know is in your brain, but yes. Yeah. And it, that's for disabled adults. Right. So, that, yeah, that is correct. Great. Okay. We, so, we, okay. Thank you. Go um, ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So what option is best for you? Because Every option that I could sit here and explain today, if there's 30 people on this webinar, your options are different because we're different people. We have different resources, different expectations, different families. Um, so it's so it's one of the things about being a care manager that I love the most is how individualized we can make that um, those options. We can sit down with somebody and say. What are your resources? What's your family like? Who is part of your care plan? Um, I think Heather or Lisa mentioned early this morning when we were talking, you know, that Dementia Alliance wants to be part of your care plan, um, care team. So we want to find out who is on your care team so that we can individualize 
what is best for you. But today I'm going to talk in sort of a generic term of what is best for everybody and then we can talk more about individualizing it later. Some people, what is best for them to age in place, which means they remain in their home, they're able to maintain their routine and their familiar environment, but others moving into a facility is what's best for them. They have care around the clock, socializations, meals, housekeeping, those types of things. So what option is best for you? I can't say without knowing your situation and what your wishes are. Um, most people want to try to age at home, but sometimes that's not always possible. So we talk about what is best for each person. Um, so what services would best support my aging? Um, there's only a couple things on this slide, but assisted living, um, skilled nursing, and home health care. There's really a lot of things that we could talk about. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about things kind of in order, if you will. So home health care. Home health care is when you have somebody come into your home to provide the services that you need. Um, most companies will provide care for from one hour up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we have clients who just use us as needed. So they may call and say, hey, I have a doctor's appointment. I need somebody to take me or I'm not feeling well. I need to go to the grocery store. Can somebody do that? Um, so home health care is kind of, again, personalized to what your needs are. We have clients that use us, like I said, as needed. And we have several clients that use us 24-7. They cannot be alone. So they need a caregiver in the house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the next level of care would actually be independent living. Um, that's the least expensive, but it's also the least um, services that are available to you. So independent living, um, it may offer you the meals that you might need, the housekeeping that you might need, but it doesn't provide any of that personal care that you may need. So independent living isn't gonna pay for somebody to come in and give you your medicine or help you get dressed or help you with a shower. Those are additional expenses that you would need to pay if you were living in an independent living type facility. You'd have to, again, supplement with some type of home care in order to get those types of services. Um, Assisted living is going to be the next level of care, and that will that will offer you the meals, the housekeeping, the laundry, um, and that personal care that you may need. So they'll do bathing, dressing, grooming, medication management. All of those things can be provided in assisted living. And then there's skilled nursing. So skilled nursing is where you might be bed bound, you might have a feeding tube, a PEG tube, you might need IV antibiotics, um, you might need the therapy, physical therapy or occupational therapy, um, sort of near, closer to the end of your life, you might need skilled nursing. Um, within assisted living and skilled nursing, you will frequently be able to find what we call memory care. Um, so it's a little different than just your typical assisted living facility or just your skilled nursing facility. There will be a special unit. Um, a lot of people will call it a locked unit or a secured unit that will offer care for somebody who has dementia. Um, in assisted living, again, people who have, need help bathing, dressing, grooming, um, medication management, um, they may be in that secured memory care unit where they have specially trained staff to deal with dementia and their behaviors. Um, the units are often locked to protect the person from leaving the facility or um, it being a danger to themselves. Um, but in assisted, within an assisted living facility, they may or may not offer you memory care. So again, when you're talking about placement, you're looking for a loved one, you want to make sure that within your assisted living that you choose, memory care is an option if your loved one has memory issues. Now, I like to, I, I think that the majority of people who live in assisted living facility have some kind of dementia. Um, so just because your loved one has dementia doesn't mean that they have to be in memory care or in a secured unit. Those units are for people who may have behavior issues or are exit seeking um, 
or just as they decline cognitively, they have better trained staff to deal with their dementia. So the in assisted living, you wanna make sure that they have a secured unit for your loved one in case as they decline, they need um, a secured unit. Same thing goes for skilled nursing. Not all skilled nursings are gonna have a memory care unit. Some of them are, I would say about 40% of the ones here in Moore County have a locked unit, um, but not all, so 60% so of them don't have a locked unit. So um, you wanna make sure as you're looking for placement for someone, if that person has dementia and you're looking at down the road and as they decline, it, should you ever need memory care, is that gonna be an option at the facility that you choose? So home care, independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, all of those are the long-term housing and services that can be offered to you. Within each of those settings, you can qualify for additional services such as hospice, Medicaid, um, a, a CAP worker. You can be in assisted living and still have a caregiver. You can be in independent living and hire somebody to come in and do the things that they would do for you in assisted living, but you know a more independent environment and that's what you want. So you can subsidize in each of these environments. Um, you can be at home and have hospice. You can be in independent living and have hospice. You can be in assisted living or skilled nursing and hire a caregiver or hospice to help you. So those are just some of the services. Um, what services would best support your aging? Again, this is the different facilities offer different types of services. We talked about that already. Um, the one place that we didn't talk about before is the Continuum of Care Retirement Facility. That's gonna be the facility that offers from independent living, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing. It's gonna offer all of those on the same campus. So it's gonna give you the opportunity to what they call age within the community. So a continuum of care that is offered to you. So you can move into that facility and um, stay um, throughout your life. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, those details in a minute. Assisted living, state licensed, residential communities. Again, it includes meal preparation, laundry, housekeeping, medication reminders generally paid by, by using private funds, but there is, a, there is a state program called special assistance that if you qualify financially, will help you pay for assisted living. Skilled nursing, they're licensed by the state. They have to have a nurse on staff 24 seven. Um, they provide your room and board, they provide activities. Often rehab services, of course, your medical supervision, you'd have a doctor on staff and almost all the skilled nursing facilities participate in the Medicaid program. Continuum of care, they're traditionally licensed by the state, housing is planned and operated, providing a continuum like I talked about, could include independent living, congregate housing, assisted living, skilled nursing, um, Typically for CCRCs, there is an entry fee. So you would pay for them, you would pay to move into this facility. You'd still pay your monthly fees to continue to live there. But should you run out of money, they would continue to take care of you for the rest of your life. Um, so that's the point of the entry fee. Independent living, multi-unit senior housing, provide services such as meals, housekeeping, transportation, activities. It really encourages your socialization, but independence. Um, so frequently we see in independent living facilities, they might have um, a movie theater or a very social group that goes out prior to COVID, unfortunately, um, routinely, daily, weekly, um, they will offer you transportation to your doctor's appointments to go shopping. Um, so they not only do transportation for medical things, but also for social things, which is really important. Um, so they, they really focus on that being social and being independent, but having a little bit of support around you. Family. How will my aging affect my family members? 
It will affect them emotionally, physically, and financially. How can my family support me while I'm aging? They can attend support groups and um, they can help you attend medical appointments. They can pr actually provide the care that you need. Um, a lot of, uh, we run into that a lot where we have um, what we call the well spouse and the spouse that has dementia. So the person that's been providing care is the well spouse. Um, and they eventually get burned out and they're calling us looking for assistance. So family can actually provide that hands-on care. Will your family be contributing to the cost of your care? It's early, it's important to know early on so that you can prepare what you're not only what your family is willing to contribute to you, but what you're able to contribute to yourself. Providing physical care is a physical task. Will your families be able to physically handle you as you decline? Um, are you able to physically handle your loved ones as they decline? Or will you be um, hiring somebody to come into the house and help take care of your loved one? Um, it, it's important to, to know how physically taxing and emotionally taxing it is. Yes, it does save money um, for families to provide the care in the home, but frequently we end up taking care of the well spouse because they haven't taken care of themselves for spending their life taking care of the spouse that has the dementia or physical needs. Um, so we want to make sure that there's a balance in place, like that, that person that is providing the care in the house or even in a facility, um, that they have a good support system in place. Emotional, the emotional strain that aging can take on families, watching one grow older puts another's morality in their face, supporting one another through the challenges that aging presents. So we want, we want to make sure that you're focusing on and knowledgeable of how caregiving takes an emotional toll. And I, I feel like that's one of the things that Dementia Alliance does a really great job of providing that support that people who are caregiving, they, they offer support groups, respite. Um, so there's a lot of things that they, the educational stuff um, where they can offer help for those people that are doing the caregiving. So they can kind of help with this emotional piece right here that's so important for us to take care of ourselves so that we can care for others. Um, how can your family support you? They can attend support groups to learn more about what you're going through and to learn that they're not alone. Um, they can attend your medical appointments and kind of help you facilitate what needs to happen before and after those appointments and just be supportive being there for you. Support groups are a great option to meet others in the same situation. Um, we used to always do support groups in person, but thanks to good old COVID, we're now doing a lot of those um, online. Um, kind of like what today is like, there are options for um, family members to get on and, and talk to other family members who have um, been going through the same experience that you have, um, kind of understand you to, to meet with them. There are support groups for almost every issue that you might be experiencing. So there are caregiver support groups. There are support groups for the person who actually is suffering from the dementia. There are support groups for most diseases um, that are out there. Um, so we can provide with you, for you guys a list of the local support groups. Dementia Alliance has a list of their support groups on their website as well. Attending appointments, it's so important for somebody who has dementia to have somebody there for them for their appointments. Um, so they need that family member or care manager or somebody to be their advocate to learn what's going on with that person's health and to provide support, being there for the doctor, making sure they, if there's medication changes, that those med changes take place, if there's a new diagnosis, they they're educated and aware of what those diagnoses are and making sure that they're attending their appointments regularly. Remaining by your side, it provides comfort until the end of somebody's life, creating a calm environment, finding out what's important to your loved one and finding ways to relate to the individual and spending time 
with that individual. Um, when we talk about our planning, we'll get into this more next week, but we talk a lot about, um, we talk a, a lot about finding out what is important to each person individually and what they want for the end of their life, what their, what your expectations are. Um, so it's important as you're remaining by your loved one's side that you know what their wishes are and that you're following what their wishes are, not exactly what your wishes are. Advocacy, what could a care manager do for, for you? That's making sure um, that you have somebody in your corner when you need them the most. So not everybody's lucky and has family that's willing and able just to help them. Um, and even if they do have family that's willing and able to help them, sometimes that person still needs some advocacy and support for themselves. And that's where um, care management can come into place. So um, care managers can attend your doctor's appointments, manage your medications, pay the bills, schedule your appointments. And again, my opinion, be there in a crisis can be most important. Um, a lot of home care agencies and care management companies like Aging Outreach Services, we offer an emergency program that would allow you to have access to us 24 seven. So should you get into a crisis or your loved one starts having symptoms that you don't know how to manage or you can't help them with, you would be able to call us in an emergency to step in and help. Um, most importantly, a lot of times going back to the well spouse, the person who is well ends up getting sick. So what happens to the person who has dementia when they're at home and their loved ones in the hospital? So we, we help you create a plan in order to um, make sure that when a crisis occurs that we can help you. Here's all the legal stuff that Jennifer Garner is going to talk about. On Thursday, we'll go through it really quickly today. Um, the power of attorney, we want to make sure that you have a power of attorney in place, somebody that can help you financially and, and with your health care decisions. Um, you're able to make your decisions on your own until you have been deemed unable to do so. Um, but at that point, when you're unable to make your own decisions, who do you want acting on your behalf? And it's really important to have those documents in place. It's really important to make sure that the person that you've appointed to be your financial and health care power of attorney is aware of what your wishes are. The living will, um, we hear a lot about living wills. It basically instructs your family and medical providers on the treatments that you want to receive. Um, we like to use the document called Five Wishes. Um, it kind of spells out your living will, what your expectations are down to what kind of music you would want to have played. Do you want lotion? Do you want a massage? Uh, do you want to be left alone? Do you want a feeding tube? All those types of things are discussed in that document called Five Wishes, um, but that's part of your living will. A do not resuscitate order if you want um, for when the EMS shows up and they find you without a heartbeat and without um, and you're not breathing, do you want them to perform CPR on you? If not, then you need to have a document in place. Otherwise, they're obligated to perform CPR on you. But if you're found without a heartbeat and you're not breathing um, and you don't want them to resuscitate you, you actually need a document saying, do not resuscitate me. The most is a... a sort of a, um, it's called medical orders for scope of treatment and it's some more detailed plan. It's, it's almost like your living will and your DNR together. Um, again, you fill out the form, your doctor signs it, you put it on your refrigerator. It's something that you would want to discuss with family and medical providers and make sure that everybody's on the same page and knows. This is the five wishes thing. Who do you want to make your decisions? What kind of medical treatment do you want? How comfortable do you want to be? How do you want people to treat you? What you want your loved ones to know about what your wishes are? Elder care lawyers, they can help with a variety of things. They can help manage your finances. They can do, be a guardian if you need that. Um, and they can act on your behalf if you can't. So. Crisis intervention. Does anybody have any questions? Before, are there questions, Lisa, before I go on to crisis intervention? Uh, no, not right now. Okay. Good. All right. Um, who should I call when there is an emergency and in-home options for um, peace of mind? So 
You, of course, you could call 911 if you have an emergency. Um, we, we, again, individualize. Each client's needs are different. Their skills are different. Um, if you have an emergency alert system in place. So there are a lot of different options for emergency alert systems. And again, we'll get into details next week, but um, it, you know, it's important to have some kind of system in place. So whether it's our 1-800 number, whether it's I've fallen and I can't get up button, whether it's a watch, you know, whatever you're, whatever you need, you want to make sure that you have some kind of emergency alert system in place. So if you can't call 911, you can still get help. Um, you can call again the AOS Cares, a care manager, and of course you could call your families. In-home options for emergency type things. Um, there are fall detection necklaces and bracelets that can connect to emergency responders. There are watches, there are cameras. Um, most of the, the, the alarms in the homes now have fall detection, which is great. So they're gonna alert for fire, for fall, for, um, I have one client who really just wanted to know that if he, did not contact if he was if he couldn't be in contact that somebody would come take care of his dog so he has a system set up where every day they check in on him if he doesn't check back then they call us um, to go and check on him but he because his concern is he's a bachelor and he lives at home alone his concern is that something might happen to him and, so, and unexpectedly would eventually happen to his dog. He said, I don't care what happens to me, but I don't want my dog to suffer. So um, again, each person is different. Often we have baby monitors in the home for caregivers um, so that the individual that they're caring for can have some privacy, but that there's some safety supervision in place. Um, so if the client would need somebody, the caregiver could see and or hear that they needed help. What is available in your area? Finding someone to help. So Aging Life Care Association. So I talk a lot about Moore County and our surrounding counties because that's where we focus. But there are care managers all over the state and all over this country. Um, so I know Lisa had said yesterday that we might have some people joining us from Tennessee or New Jersey. There are care, care managers in that area too. So you would use um, this link here for Aging Life Care Association and they could help you. Um, finding what is available in your area, that's what we're gonna discuss um, on Tuesday, find the resources and how to access them. And that's it. So let's talk, let's ask questions in chat. Jennifer, do you want to continue sharing your screen in case you need to refer back to anything? That's fine if you do. Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, we had uh, more of a, a comment that got answered in the chat, but I just wanted to share. Someone said that um, George actually mentioned that his wife has FTD and that he has concerns about his memory and he was concerned for his future care. So Susan suggested that he reach out to AOS to talk to um, a care manager to help set up a plan. Uh, can you expand a little bit more on maybe what would happen in that sure. first meeting? Sure. So in, in the first meeting, we would sit down and kind of talk about what your goals are and what you would want to happen should something happen to you or as your wife declines throughout the progress of FTD. Um, and then we would set some goals, like how can we reach, how can you and I reach what you want to happen? Um, so we put some steps into place. Um, and then I would make some recommendations and suggestions of services that are available in our area that you just may not be aware of, um, that I feel like we could benefit from, not just from aging outreach, but other services that are available that I feel like you might need um, in the future. Um, and just help you kind of put together that action plan, if you will, for how we can get to your goals. Um, we do a complimentary one hour um, initial assessment. It's not an assessment, it's more of like, here's what we can do for you type service 
So the first hour is free. Um, and we can say, here's what we can do for you. And then you can decide from there whether or not you want us to move forward and help you um, put together that plan. I, I see most of my clients for about an hour a week. Um, and I help with everything from grocery shopping to meal preparation to um, menu planning, medication administration, uh, reordering meds, attending doctor's appointments, being the family liaison. Um, I, frequently, I end up being the family mediator because, as we know, not all families agree with what should happen with their loved ones. So we do a lot of family mediation and meetings and just keeping families up to date and me being able to see that person on a, on a weekly basis, then I pick up on things that somebody that's living with them may not pick up on. Um, so I would, you know, be monitoring that person. And, and another thing that we frequently get hired for is care planning. So putting together a plan of care for an older adult who has caregivers in the house or has family taking care of that loved one or is even in a facility, what the family expectations are and how we can get um, the caregivers to meet those expectations. Jennifer, this is Susan. Do you find that the family that are supporting a person with a diagnosis in the home, that that situation becomes challenging for them and you see a decline in the well spouse's he um, health? So frequently, yes, because they they don't forget, but they forget to take care of themselves. They, they put so much love and effort into making sure that their loved one is cared for and has everything that they need. And um, they, they put themselves on the back burner, if you will. And therefore, we frequently see that the well spouse will end up being hospitalized or having a heart attack or stroke um, because they just haven't been taking care of themselves. And then nobody's left to take care of the person that has dementia um, or they can no longer take care of them. So they end up in crisis and they don't have a good plan in place because they really had hoped that they would just take care of that person forever. So we frequently see that. And do you see that that helps the well spouse and their family stay better and better health? Um, do I do I find do you, that having a care manager and having a plan helps? Yes. 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 Definitely. Having having a plan, an action plan, and having somebody that can kind of help you make sure that things are. Um, moving in the right direction for both the person that has dementia as well as the caregiver um, is extremely important because then that's how we can keep you healthy and meet your goals of being able to take care of your loved one forever. Because I think that's I think that's what most people's goals are is, you know, um, my wife is ill and, I, you know, for better or worse and sickness and health, I'm going to take care of her no matter what. Um, and I and I feel like we we can help meet those expectations, but be realistic about how that's going to happen, whether that means being in a facility, hiring care, um, t doing respite stays places so that you can get a break, that kind of thing. Jennifer, this is Lisa. We had a question about uh, power of attorney, and, and that's on the screen right now. Um, can you tell us who determines when a power of attorney kicks in? How do we know that someone is not able to make their decisions anymore. And is that a judge or a family member? Who decides when that happens? Okay, so that's a really good question. And Jennifer Garner will probably is, well, she's definitely your expert in that. But what we see typically is if you have two doctors who write a note saying that that person is unable to make their decisions any longer, then for the most part, then that power of attorney can be activated. If that person does not have a power of attorney, but they're to a point where they can no longer make decisions, that's when we often see that the courts come involved and the judge has to make the decision. So they'll do what they call a competency hearing um, to determine if that person is competent or not. And then that person 
can um, will then be appointed a guardian. So, but sometimes we have people who have put in writing, you know, I want my daughter to be my power of attorney when the time comes, but the time has come and that mom's like, no, I don't need help. I'm not going to do that. I, there's nothing wrong with me. And then we end up in court then anyway. Um, and a judge has to make the decision. So just to make, to be safe, but that's definitely a Jennifer Garner. She's going to walk you through all those details Thursday. Great. So everybody needs to tune in Thursday at 10 o'clock for this mm -hmm. next session with Jennifer. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question about um, care facilities now and assisted living primarily. And I'm not sure that you might know this answer or not, but because you have a lot of history in long-term care, you may. Do you find that most facilities will allow families to bring in and outside help if they pay them above and beyond the facility rate? And are there facilities that won't allow you to do that? And do you know too if, um, especially in assisted living, will they, chair, will they charge a higher level of care rate even if a family member is bringing in additional services? So every facility is different. Um, we very rarely run across a facility that will not let somebody be hired and come in and help them because we're really a help to them. You know, it frees up their staff a lot. It's not any money out of their pocket. They're not getting any less or more money. Um, so for the most part, assisted livings and skilled nursings, and of course, independent living, they will allow the outside help. Um, we have come across a couple of issues where um, the facility might say you have to use a certain company um, because we have a contract with that company or they also work with us and so they're allowed on campus or whatever. Um, but as residents have rights, um, the residents' rights, that they can fight that <laughs> and um, they should be allowed to have outside help if they want it. Um, that should not be an issue. Um, as far as the level of care goes, um, if, if the level of care is, is a high level of care, and that's why you're having to have somebody come in and you have somebody come in for six hours a day, um, those other 18 hours in the day, there's still that high level of care. Um, so just because you had somebody come in and help you get through the hard parts doesn't mean that you're not still um, a higher level of care when they're not there. So some facilities will continue to charge you that um, level of care fee because you technically are. Um, if you had 24 hour care inside the facility, I wouldn't expect that you'd have to pay that higher level of care. If you had care um, during all of your waking hours, then it's something that you could go back to that facility and say, you know, why are you charging us this level of care? Because you guys are only providing care when mom's asleep. Um, and, you know, she's not a higher level of care then as she would be during the day. Um, so it's something that you can question. But every facility is different. Rarely have we ever, I mean, of course, through COVID we did, but that's opened up now um, where a facility will not let outside help come in. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so if someone is not currently working with AOS, and I think you'll answer this next Tuesday, but um, if they're not working with AOS, but they need a break, the caregivers decided they've, they've needed a break and they, they need a little help for a short time, a respite, if you will. Um, where's a good place to start with that? Calling the care, calling me, <laughs> calling the care manager is always the best place to start um, because the care manager is going to listen to what your story is and what's going on with you and help you determine exactly what you need. We, I mean, we have clients who just need a caregiver for a short period of time, um, but the care manager could help you determine whether you need to be on our emergency program, what benefits you might qualify for, what grants might be available to you, um, and, and help you with that plan. Um, so we want to, we want that person to talk to a care manager first, um, and let that care manager help determine whether or not they need just caregivers or if there's more to their story um, and we'll guide them in the right direction. So calling um, for the care manager, calling 
for me. You could call and just say, you know, I really want to have that hour consult with Jennifer. Um, so setting up that consult with me to help you determine exactly what you need is the best place to start. And I'm sorry, did you say that that at first hour is free? Yes. Okay, and then is there sort of a schedule of rates after that? Is it a flat fee? It's usually $90 an hour past that. Um, we do an assessment um, fee. That's $400 for an individual or $500 for a couple. And that would give you a report that would um, typically for one person, it's about eight pages for a couple, it might be 10 or 12 pages but it's basically what our findings are and what our suggestions and recommendations would be for that person. Um, so it ends up being, you know, around 10 page type report for you where everything's kind of in one place and it's gonna include everything that we recommend for you to do. You're not required to do anything that we recommend once that report is completed, um, but it's sort of a great place, a great starting point for everybody to say, okay, here's, we have all this information about this client and here's all the things that we're recommending. We give that back to the client and the client says, okay, I want to do A, B, D, and Z, um, but I'm not ready to do the rest, but they still have those recommendations in one place where they can go back and go, okay, I think I'm ready to do C now. Um, so, um, so that is $400 for an individual, $500 for a couple. Um, and then we have the on-call service, which is $450 a year. Um, that gives you access to us 24-7 for an individual, $550 a year for a couple. Um, again, it gives you access to us 24-7. And do you think that um, across the state or even in other states maybe, the the services are sort of similar um yeah very much so very much so so the raleigh area is going to be a little more expensive than we are here um but i would say a good guess on what care management would cost across the country would be somewhere between 75 and 125 dollars an hour so we're probably on the lower end here at $90 an hour, but it's pretty you know, complimentary for where we are and what we offer. And I just wanted to mention too, that if someone um, is looking for some respite assistance, there's a lot of programs out there, Project Care through the state of North Carolina. Um, you know, There's some other programs, but, but it does help to have somebody guide you through those yeah. and navigate those. And like you said before, there's a waiting list for a lot of things. So your care manager, or you can call uh, the care navigator here at Dementia Alliance, and uh, we can help you through through those hoops, if you will. So <laughs> Yeah, we do, we do that as well. So we're going to look at what your resources are, what your insurance is. Do you have long-term care insurance? Do you qualify for some of these grants and respite programs? We're going to try to get you everything we can, um, you know, not, it doesn't have to be free, but like at a rate that you can afford. We're going to try to put together a plan that financially works for you and it also sort of meets your goals. So we also have a program called AOS and Friends Care. And it is, um, again, you qualify it based on your finances, but it can offer um, up to uh, about 15 hours of caregiver services and uh, about five hours of care management services um, that can allow you to put together that plan um, you know, that in that five hours, the care manager could put together the plan for you, guide you in the right direction. You could get the caregivers to come into the house and do, you know, give you a couple of days of break. So, yep. So we always want to make sure that you're getting everything you can. That sounds great. Um, so here's another question of specifically about power of attorney. And I'm, I'm I understand that, that Jennifer is going to answer answer this much more um, on Thursday, but if someone um, has a financial power of attorney in effect that they can sign their name, do you know if they should be signing or should it be the power of attorney signing or does it depend on the circumstance? Are you Well, if the person has been declared incompetent, they should not be signing. Um, so the power of attorney, if the power of attorney has been activated and recorded at the courthouse, 
then the person that is the power of attorney should be the person that's signing and assisting with finances. Um, but if that person has not legally been declared incompetent, um, they can ask for help. I mean, just like I could go and say, hey, mom, would you help me pay these bills today here? Write my, you know, write my checks for me or whatever. So they can, if, if they're competent enough, they can ask for help, you know, and somebody can help them. Um, but legally, if they have been declared incompetent, they should not be, they shouldn't have access to the financial stuff at all. It just, it just protects them in the long run from being exploited. Okay. Um, great. Um, I, Susan, do you see any questions that I've missed? I think I've got most of them covered here. You did a great job, Lisa. You've asked everything I was getting ready to ask. <laughs> um, Susan, Half of you, the participants. Okay, Susan, you mentioned um, that AOS and Friends Care is a nonprofit with grants to help provide services. Jennifer or Susan, can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Susan, you want to do that? Yeah, um, they have a direct um, care funding um, that Jennifer can talk a little bit more about it, but it's up to $1,000 for income qualified eligible um, individuals, and they can receive caregiving services, respite care, adult daycare options, um, identify benefits, equipment, placement assistance, care needs, help coordination. And Jennifer, what else can we do for them? Um, I think that's about it. So it, it does, you have to qualify financially and your loved one needs to have a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and, and the board, we, we take your application to the board and they decide exactly how much you qualify for. So it's up to $1,000 a year. That's the maximum. You have to re-qualify every year if you want to, you know, if you use your $1,000, you qualified for $1,000 and you used it up. And then the next year you want to try again, you can send in another application and ask for another $1,000. That's a wonderful resource. Thank you. Sure. That's fantastic. Um, at Dimension Alliance, we have some uh, caregiver respite assistance funds as well. So um, they're, uh, they're taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, usually it's $500 per, but those can be used for anything, including helping to get care from Jennifer and the team at AOS. So there are options out there for people. It's just navigating them. Um, trying to find all those. Sometimes caregivers are so stressed out they don't know where to start. So hopefully today's session gives you a good place. Um, we will be covering advanced directives um, on Thursday. So we will be going over a lot more of powers of attorney and those kinds of things. I hope everyone will join us for those questions where you can get a little bit more specific information information. Jennifer's going to come back on Tuesday and give us more resources to help us with our plan. I'm sure we'll talk more about respite and those kinds of services there. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk about payment resources. We're going to go into more of Medicare, Medicaid, long-term care, all of those kind of payment things. And Jennifer Garner is going to help us with that. Uh, does anybody have any other questions right now that maybe we haven't answered? I'd want to make sure that we capture everything from everyone. I'm sort of scanning our chat as we go uh, to make sure that we haven't missed anything. And um, I did want to remind everyone that if you have someone who would benefit from the series, they can still register and we will be sending all of the recordings to everyone who's registered. So whether they were registered today or not, if they register tomorrow for the Thursday session, we'll make sure that, that we're on there. Um, Jennifer, is there anything else that, that you wanted to add for us? Yeah, actually, I, I want to make sure that everybody that's on here has gone through and been properly diagnosed with dementia and may, hopefully maybe even a more specific type 
of disease other than just the umbrella term dementia and talk about how important it is to get that proper diagnosis um, so that we are making the right recommendations um, and guiding people in the right direction. Um, we, you know, our local resource and expert is Dr. Karen Sullivan. Um, you know, she does the neuropsychological testing. So, you know, if your loved one has been diagnosed with dementia and you've just seen your primary care doctor, I don't know what happened to the screen there, but, um, and you've only seen your primary care doctor and you haven't been to a neurologist, you haven't been to a neuropsychologist, you haven't been to um, a psychologist, um, I really encourage you to make sure that you have done your research and attended the appointments that you need to attend to make sure that your loved one has been properly diagnosed. Um, that is going to determine treatment plans, prognosis, placement. There's so many things. Um, we often see, we, we meet a new client and they go, oh, my mom has dementia. And we say, oh, you know, sorry to hear that. You know, what's been going on? Oh, she's forgetting where her keys are. And her doctor said she has dementia. And so she's on Aricep. Well, <laughs> you know, there's so much more to a diagnosis than just that. So uh, I really wanna encourage every person that's in this forum right now that if your loved one has not been properly diagnosed, you have not been through those channels, that um, Thursday, or I'm sorry, next Tuesday, that, that come with some questions about what you should do um, to make sure that your loved one is properly diagnosed. That's such a great and important point. Thank you for, for saying that. I think sometimes people just say, oh, we're getting older. Yeah. And, and not necessarily so. Yep, that's right. I mean, there are, there are reversible types of dementia. People forget that. Um, you know, there are types of dementia, like depression can call, mimic the same symptoms as dementia. And frequently we've, in my career, we've had, you know, I've had somebody that's been diagnosed with dementia and really they were just suffering from depression and on the right meds, they're, they really don't have dementia anymore. Um, so I just want to make sure that that if you're here and you're saying that I'm looking through a lot of the questions that you guys sent in ahead of time, you know, beginning stages, general knowledge, that type of thing, I want to make sure that you have done what needs to be done to make sure that your loved one has been properly diagnosed. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time yeah. today and your expertise. It was such a a thorough explanation of everything. And we are going to send out your slides to everyone. So they probably will have more questions for you next yeah, week. Mm -hmm. Hopefully everybody will join us then. And we want to thank everyone for participating. We want to thank AOS and Jennifer Garner Law for being with us. Um, and we hopefully will see everybody back here Thursday morning. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.